molecules, the better atoms. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks for having me here because uh, we are not atom people now, we are molecule people, and this is a little bit different. So we're kind of the outlaws of a Maximal Project. Uh, and um, I thought uh, I'd make a short introduction before uh, Fabian and Patrick go to the, t uh, to the real physics. I just want to motivate uh, why, why would one, someone want to do molecules? Uh, and I mean, for this, we have to know like, uh, what, are, what are the atoms are actually giving us. And, and uh, I go back into history to uh, show you that uh, this atomic spectroscopy was invented actually already by uh, Josef von Fraunhofer almost 200 years ago. He's actually born in the same city as I was. <laughs> so uh, it's in the family more or less. Uh, and I mean, you know this picture here in the stamp, this, uh, this dark stripes in the Fraunhofer spectrum he um, uh, has seen. Uh, and he has made, put numbers on these guys, A, B, C, D, and so on, but he had no idea why, why, why are there some lines missing in this uh, spectrum from the sun. Uh, and to the first more, let's say, quantitative idea what happened here is, for example, if we look at the, at the line um, C um, in the red, then uh, I can zoom in here. Perhaps this is a more detailed um, picture of the Fraunhofer spectrum. Um, and the line, I believe it's this one here, I tried carefully to find it. And this line here is actually the, um, the hydrogen alpha line, which uh, was uh, first seen by Jakob, or Jakob Balmer was the first one to really assign this to hydrogen to the Balmer series. So this was the first uh, description uh, of these lines in terms of power loss, how this scales, this line, and this is basically the first quantitative analysis of an atomic structure without knowing anything about the atom. And this happened in the, in the, in the mid-late 19th century. But I mean, thinking about the Fraunhofer was the beginning of the 19th century, it's not so far in the future at this time point. And um, if we again look at this um, spectrum here, then we have here uh, another important feature. Uh, there's two lines, actually. Uh, and this is a so-called sodium D line. It's D is not for double because it was just the number D in this Fraunhofer numbering of the lines. This is where the D is coming from. And if we look now at the periodic system, I mean, we see that the atoms we just looked at was like the hydrogen and the alkali atoms. Um, these are atoms which are very good for spectroscopy because you see like that these are really uh, make a, a really uh, thick absorption. This means these are atoms which interact very nicely with light fields. And there is, uh, and if we look now at the wavelengths uh, which are involved in there, then you see that we have here um, in hydrogen, if you want to go from the ground state to the excited state, the Balmer series starts from excited state to an even higher excited state. That's not very useful for spectroscopy. But if you go from ground state, then you see that like the atom lithium to whatever cesium are all nicely in the visible or in the near infrared, uh, and you easily can do spectroscopy on these guys. I mean, so easily that uh, this guy here, Alfred Kastler, built uh, uh, a lamp uh, to make spectroscopy on these rubidium gases. Uh, and I mean, this was, uh, he got the Nobel Prize in 1966, two years before the laser was invented. He already did coherent spectroscopy in these gases. So basically, he is the guy who invented optically pumping. When you see one of these little glass, glass cells he has in hand, this is a vapor cell. And although they are like, um, uh, 50, 60 years old, they're still a full functional operational. So this is a technology which is very robust. Okay, now uh, who else is there in the atomic gases? I mean, if you look there, we had like the, the noble gases on the other side. Uh, these are the other atomic gases we have uh, at our hands, but you see the wavelengths are a little bit nasty. So for helium, you would need a 58 nanometer laser. Uh, I mean, there might be a chance for radon at 179 nanometer laser. Uh, which is existent. Uh, you can have a CW 179 nanometer laser. It's a beast, I guess. Uh, but you don't want to have a, a full cell of radon, I guess. No? So you would have to go to the xenon, and then the wavelength is uh, already not available anymore. So this means we only have the, the, the left column and the right column as atomic gases, which would, we could work. Uh, the, the noble gases, I mean, we have an issue because of, um, of the wavelengths. And now the question is like, if you want to use something else, I mean, there's also molecules, uh, which can be in a gas phase. Uh, so we have to combine all the rest inside somehow to make a gas out of this. And it should be, as po uh, it should be uh, like an alkali atom. So the question is like, can we have an alkali molecule for spectroscopy? And actually, if you combine the second group, the earth alkaline atoms, 
uh, with, uh, with fluor, then you have in the second group, all these atoms have two electrons in the outer shell. The fluor is missing one electron. So what the fluor does, it grabs entirely one of these electrons and holds it tight and doesn't give it away anymore. And then you have a lonely electron sitting out there. And this basically behaves as an alkali atom. I can show you. This is from a uh, thesis from Loic Andrek. Uh, they, they made calculations of the orbitals. And what you see in, in black here, uh, you have the, the, um, the uh, calcium. And in yellow, you have the fluor. And you see the fluor takes one of the electron. And the second electron makes an orbit, which is looking for the x sigma, which is the ground state, uh, completely away from this molecular bond. It just lives on the other side. It doesn't care about the molecular bond. It's just hanging out there. And if you look at the side, it said a pi. Um, it's like a nice p orbital. And this means these states don't talk to the rotations and the vibration of these molecules, almost not. And this means that you can now uh, use um, uh, cycling tracer, uh, almost cycling laser transitions to do spectroscopy on these atoms. I mean, if you check here, I made a little circle in this diagram. This is from the, from the vibration and crown state, uh, nu equals zero to the, to the electronic excited state, also nu equals zero, the transition. And you have a 98% probability that it falls back. So this means it behaves like an alkali atom, but still you have, of course, all the other rotational and vibrational states, which might be interesting for whatever business. I mean, you could think about uh, putting the, some quantum information into this thing, uh, and um, these molecules are most looked at because they have huge electric fields in there, uh, and this is a thing which is interesting for searching for a permanent uh, moment of the electron, like the EDM measurements. And also, I mean, as these transitions are quite forbidden between uh, two different vibrational states, uh, you could even think about making clocks out of this. And here's an example of two molecular clocks which are actually investigated. The one is again on calcium fluoride. Uh, and there's a transition from nu equals zero to nu equals one. We, we remember these are almost uh, orthogonal transition, like forbidden transitions. And you're not going to excite it, say. You just stay in the ground state. So this wavelength is only in the terahertz regime. Uh, but if you, for example, take this N2 plus uh, molecule, then you see that you get to 129 terahertz, which is coming uh, to, the, to the infrared. Uh, and and these guys might be really uh, useful clocks, not only atomic clocks, but there could be molecular clocks. But the thing is, like this calcium fluoride, uh, it's not really a gas. I mean, you can make it. It's flying around. You, you spectro do spectroscopy in the gas phase, but if it hits another calcium fluoride, it's over. And if it hits the wall, also. So you have to make this in a chemical process. So the question is like, what about real gaseous gases? Stuff which comes from a bottle, it's a gas, it stays a gas, and can you do something there? And I mean, if we look just at one example, like the N2, now not as an ion, if we go from the X uh, to the A state, then you see in the order of like 17 electron volts, so that's deep, deep, deep in the UV. And most of the stuff, O2, whatever you have there, you, you need a, a crazy UV laser to do the spectroscopy. But you can, uh, I mean, if we take another atom uh, for acetylene, I only found this data from 87, which is actually energy loss by electron impact. Uh, you see at eight electron volts about, you see nice uh, lines. These are actually the lines uh, which are electronic transition from the ground to the excited state. Eight electron volts is way, also way to the UV. But you see also a lot of absorption here uh, at lower energies. And what people, of course, do if they do spectroscopy, they don't go to the excited state, they just go to from vibrational to vibrational states. And you can do coherent spectroscopy there, although you have not really perfect closed transition. But in this uh, acetylene, um, there was an experiment, it's quite some years ago, by the Phil Russell group, where they used just here these low vibrational bands, uh, and they just um, made a Raman type of scheme where you, they have connected um, on the P band uh, with a strong coupling laser. Um, um, to some other uh, roof vibrational state. Uh, and then with the Q-band, uh, you probe it. And then you see, with the, with the, if we have the, the red laser off in the P-band, then we would have absorption. But if we switch it on, then you get a little dip. And that's just electromagnetically induced and fancy in this crazy acetylene gas. I mean, it has bends and, and has many degrees of freedom. But you can find coherence in this system. So, but of course, I mean, we are working now with diatomic molecules. I mean, this is many, many more. The more atoms get there, and if you have angled molecules, the more horrible it gets. Um, and what we are looking in is this nitric oxide. 
And this is the white mouse of Monica spectroscopy because it has a transition from the X to the A state at 226 nanometers. And this is something which was available already in the early days of laser spectroscopy. There were excimer lasers, dye lasers, the nitrogen lasers. There was like, but they were all pulsed lasers and they have done a lot of studies on this nitric oxide on the, to the X to the A transition. But nowadays you can get CW lasers uh, since a few years. I mean, you see this beast, it's quite long and complicated. But they are there, and this is a new generation of lasers coming up with which you can now look at all kinds of molecules uh, in a high-precision, narrow-band uh, spectroscopy, which you could have not done before. So you have access to all this rotation and vibration numbers with a few megahertz line widths. And I think this is a new way to do spectroscopy, and we chose NO for a different reason. And uh, my colleagues will show you now, because this is my last slide. We go even to higher states. We can go to Rydberg states in this NO and... Um, and I would say, uh, whenever you have a new tool which you didn't have before, you use it and you will find new physics, hopefully. So it's not a TRL 7, 8 level talk, it's a TRL 1 level talk, but I mean, this is really uh, trying out new things. So thank you very much, Robert, and we go to the next speaker, uh, which will be Fabian. Uh, I'm Fabian Munkers, and I'm going to give you a talk about uh, Torrance and optogermanic flux sensor for nitric oxide based on Rydberg excitation. And uh, basically, I'm going to give you a little recipe on how to set up such a trace gas sensor. And afterwards, Patrick is going to give you the highly physical details. So still no physics in this talk. But anyways, it's a little bit more physics than previously. OK. So now this doesn't work. Maybe using a click. Yeah, that, that seems to work. OK. So what was our motivation behind this project, actually? And the targeted application of our uh, sensor is actually breath gas analysis. And uh, why did we choose nitric oxide for this? Well, actually nitric oxide plays, a, plays an important role in the human body as it is a signaling molecule for inflammatory diseases like asthma, for example. And it does so by being responsible for blood pressure, pressure regulation as well as the immune system. So when it comes to a human, um, a human being actually exhales somewhere between one and 2,000 parts per billion of nitric oxide every single breath. But in medical research, uh, usually you, you're doing this research with, with mice, so um, the gas volume, the gas volumina of this breath is pretty small, and this is where some problems arise, actually. So for human beings, we have these lung machines and so forth to, to test the amount of nitric oxide, but for mice, this becomes complicated, as we need some quite na large gas volumes to, to probe this. OK, so the, what I'm going to walk you through is actually this, this little sketch of, of our proposed sensing scheme. Um, so I'm going not to, to explain it in detail right now, but I'm going to walk you through. And the first thing I'd like to, you to look at is actually this part here, as you can see. And this is uh, describing our gas flow of, of molecules. So we have an unknown uh, amount of nitric oxide in a background gas. Um, and we have to somehow produce this gas flow. And this we do by, uh, by using our gas setup. And uh, this gas setup actually allows us to either use pure nitric oxide, just for spectroscopy and so forth, or to, to use a mixture of premix nitric oxide and uh, nitrogen dioxide. Um, and the dilution is uh, possible up to a factor of 10,000. And this is done by using a couple of mass flow controllers, as you can see here, and a couple of valves in the setup um, to, to actually combine the gases. And in reality, this looks like this. So on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of our gas setup. So the mass flow control, uh, controllers are actually hidden behind that uh, aluminum frame, but you can see a couple of valves in, on the left. This is a, pic, uh, a picture of our uh, experimental software we, we programmed for this, which actually allows us to compute uh, some, some values in standard cubic centimeters to, to actually adjust our, our pressure inside the cell. OK, so the next thing we need are some, some laser systems. So we have the first step resolved. We have the, have the molecules in, in our glass cells. So the gray frame is actually our glass cell. And now we do need the laser systems. And the uh, excitation scheme we actually came up with is shown on the lower left. So we have a three photon excitation scheme. And this three photon excitation scheme is specific to nitric oxide. So we are only able to basically excite nitric oxide to a, to a Rydberg stage. And 
obviously a Rydberg state is just some state where the valence electron is quite far away from the nucleus. And what I should also point out is that these are all continuous wave uh, systems, so each single system uh, is not pulsed here. So let's have a look at all these laser systems. So the 226 nanometer laser, you've already seen a, a little picture in, in Robert's talk, is actually the most complicated one. So it's uh, based on a titanium sapphire laser, which is pumped by a, by a laser running at 532 nanometers and 18 watts. Um, then we end up after the titanium sapphire at 904 nanometers, and we have a first doubling stage, so our blue cavity. We just do some frequency doubling in there. There's an LBAO crystal used for that. And uh, we end up at 452 nanometers. And finally, there's a second doubling stage um, with a BBO crystal. And this then allows us to, to get 50 milliwatts if we are lucky at 226 nanometers. So you can already see that we started at 18 watts and ended up at 50 milliwatts, so there's quite some loss in between. Okay, and in reality, uh, this looks like this. So we have this 2 meter 40 long system uh, to actually produce this, this light which has been bought. Okay, the, the second transition is uh, a little bit less complicated, but still we do need some amplification. So we have a fundamental laser running at 1080 nanometers, and this laser light then gets amplified using a fiber amplifier running at 10 watts, and then we have a periodically pulled lithium niobate crystal, which allows us to produce 540 nanometers in a single pass, and we end up usually at about 1 to 1.2 watts. And actually, as a little side note here, we do need that much of a power, since at least from an atomic point of view, this transition is dipole forbidden. Lastly, we do need, uh, oh, forgot that one, so this is actually a picture of the setup. On the left is the fundamental laser, and on the right, might be a bit hard to see, but that little uh, black case in the middle, that's actually the, the oven of the PPLN crystal, so the phase matching is done using the temperature. Anyways, the, the last system we actually do use is our Rydberg laser, which then gets out from the H state, so either H2 sigma plus or H2 pi state, to some uh, Rydberg state, which is usually a two sigma state. And uh, here we have an 835 nanometer laser. And this one is the, let's say, the, the, the easiest setup, as we only use a tapered amplifier to, to get some more power, but our diet laser is already running at the right uh, wavelength. And in reality, this looks like this. So uh, the lower left, the blue case, that's just the, the fundamental beam. Um, the silver case is actually uh, where the tapered amplifier resides inside. OK. So another problem actually is, if you look on the left, um, uh, to be more precise, I mean, these, these transitions are pretty narrow. And lasers tend to, to drift away. So we have to make sure that they stay right on their frequency. And for this, we set up a, a little locking setup. And this is what I'm going to explain next. So for the locking setup, we actually have a, mass, we actually have a master laser at 780 nanometers. So this is obviously also a laser which might drift around. So it's a diode laser. But we do have an ultra-low expansion cavity where we can lock this uh, laser to. And then we have a, a stable master laser locked to some frequency, some wavelengths. And now we can use the light of this master laser to actually lock some transfer cavities we built ourselves. So these transfer cavities are just um, some metal tubes and mirrors inside and a piezo crystal for, for scanning them. So we can then stabilize the length of these cavities by locking the cavity itself again to the master laser. So this is uh, shown by the uh, black arrow. So now we have uh, cavities which are stable in the length, which we can then use to actually lock our lasers to so we have uh, some fibers going from our main lab to our laser lab. That's how we call it. And then we can lock our fundamental beams, so 904, 1080, and 835, to their respective transfer cavity. And I mean, this works well, but obviously we also have to be able to, to adjust uh, the frequency still. And this is why we have a couple of EOMs there to actually uh, move our, the frequency of our experimental lasers around. And in reality, this is actually a big mess. So on, on the lower half, you can see the optical setup. There are a couple of transfer cavities in there. And the upper half is a lot of electronics. So actually, we use some, some tires. These are some programmable FPGAs. And it's based on a, uh, on a GitHub project, which we then uh, took a step further and made uh, 
a server client infrastructure so we can actually use this from all of our labs to, to lock the laser systems. Okay, finally, so we, we have the laser system, we have our gas, um, we also have some stable laser systems, but what we do need now is our current sickness. We would like to detect this uh, using, using our current. And on this little sketch here, this is stylized by the, the electrodes, so these are like those uh, lines there uh, on, on top and on the bottom, and some trans impedance amplifier. And so to actually detect our current, we do use some, some PCBs, so printed circuit sports. And on the right hand side, you can actually see one of these. So these are designed in cooperation with some uh, electronic institutes at the University of Stuttgart, and they do feature an electric amplifier. Um, the board is actually sensitive to the picoampere level. Um, and the way we actually uh, like put this on the cell, so this is an example of a cell, it's just some borosilicate glass frame, which makes it easy for a glass blower. And then we can just glue these, these uh, PCBs to our cells on top and bottom, and you can actually see that there is still some, some uh, gold visible, which is the, the lower, the bottom electrode, and the same is mirrored on top. Okay, but uh, for the UV laser, we actually use some, some quartz windows, so we also glue them to the cell, and then we have our um, you know, measurement cell. Um, so in the setup, this is how this looks like. So it's actually hidden behind this little metal frame. And from the right-hand side, the blue, uh, the, the A35, the green laser are coming. And from the left-hand side, the, the UV laser is, is entering the setup. And from top, you can see the, the tubes of the gas flow setup. Finally, we are able to, to produce some signals. So we have all the ingredients for, for our little trace gas sensor. And we actually do see already a current signal for the UV beam, at least if we use some, some high pressures and uh, we attribute this to some Rempy processes. And this is shown here in the lowest figure. Now, if we then lock actually our UV laser to the transition, we can have a look at the green laser. And uh, here the same holds true, we still have some, some high pressure. And as you can see, the, the line is way more narrow, but also the current increases by a factor of 10, roughly. And finally, we can also lock the, the green laser beam and have a look at the red signal. And this is the desired signal we are interested in. So here we significantly, significantly reduce the pressure and we still get a nice signal of our uh, Rydberg laser, which is somewhere in the two nanoamps. Okay, so let's come back a little bit to the, to the motivation of this and why we think uh, at least our sensor has some advantages. So the advantages, one of the main advantages we see is that we can use small gas volumes. I mean, you've seen the cell and the the real gas volume, at least, is just the, the volume of the laser beam. We also have some high bandwidth, which is also attributed to the, to the laser beam. Uh, the detection limit has been uh, evaluated to be somewhere to 5 to 10 ppb in a proof of concept back in, two, in 2018. Uh, we claim some absolute measurements, as we do not have to calibrate the sensor. Um, the selectivity is, is done using our laser excitation scheme, so this is... Uh, specific to nitric oxide. We are immune to light fluctuations, at least as long as we know the saturation intensity, right? So we need uh, to be in full saturation and then we are immune to that. Um, we are chemically resistance, resistant and we can operate this also at ambient pressure, which has also been shown back in 2018. Okay, so to sum this up, nitric oxide is actually a signaling molecule for inflammatory diseases like asthma, which makes it interesting for medical research. Uh, our target application, therefore, is a ridbug based sensor for breath gas analysis uh, based on the scheme shown here on the right. And the ingredients we need for that are a gas mixing unit, some laser systems, a locking setup, and a through flow cell with integrated amplification electronics. And then we actually end up with this nice little uh, plots where we plot the current against our detuning. And here, the advantages we think we have over other sensors I again mentioned, which are mainly the selectivity, the small gas volumes, and the high bandwidth. Right, so that's my last slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fabian. Um, Ilya started to fill in the chat. So first he has... <laughs> Thank you, Is this good or bad? Huh? Oh, it's good. Um, he has a first comment, so 50 milliwatt at 225 nanometers, Continuous wave, remarkable. First comment. Uh, 
Then there's the question, uh, what about the Doppler classes? Are the laser core or counter-propagating, or are they in certain angles? Okay, so for the, uh, for the three photon excitation, they are counter-propagating, so the green one and the red one are traveling the same direction, but the uh, UV one is traveling the opposite direction. We'll continue with the last one from uh, the day and from the session. It will be given by Patrick. Okay, we are ready. So it seems that now we are going deep in the physics and Patrick will explain us how this works. The floor is yours. Thanks. Um, so yeah, welcome to the final talk of our symposium. Um, yeah, we will see how many physics I will tell you. So I tried to keep the talk formula free to make it available for a broader audience, but uh, we definitely have to do some physics. So uh, let's start. So. Uh, basically, the talk is entitled Doppler Free Spectroscopy on the X2 pi 3 half to A2 sigma plus transition in nitric oxide. And um, to start with, I want to show you basically the last slide uh, Fabian used uh, just as in the previous talk where he showed you all these nice current signals. And uh, actually, this, this slide is not wrong, of course, but it's not the whole truth because uh, we don't have uh, only one transition available uh, between these uh, different energy levels. So uh, what I mean with this is that each of these black lines you see here, which is representing one of the NO energy levels, is actually split into many different uh, sub-levels of energy which are just close by. So also this 226 nanometers is actually just like an average wavelength and, and there are different lines. Um, so what we will do in this talk, uh, we will really focus on only this uh, lowest transition in the molecule and um, do some spectroscopy, which is only available to, due to the high, uh, uh, the, the narrow band CW lasers we have now, which uh, Robert presented to you. And um, yeah, to start with, uh, I plotted here the, the whole spectrum of this X to A transition of nitric oxide. This is roughly around 300 different lines, um, only including the fine structure. Um, so there's no hyper fine structure in this plot so far. And um, what Fabian now does for the gas sensor, he picks out one of these lines, or first of all, we pick out one of these branches. Uh, for the spectroscopy I will uh, show you, I picked out this outermost branch here because this is actually pretty easy to assign because it doesn't overlap with any of the other branches. So it's, it's easy to keep track uh, on, on which transition you ac actually are. And for the gas sensor, we pick then out one of these lines here. Uh, and, and this is actually what we then use for the excitation to the, to the next energy level and then to go up on the Rydberg state. Um, but what we want to do in this spectroscopy is to, to do a, another zoom in, let's say. Um, but first of all, I have to mention that uh, the, the normal transition line, transition line with, in this case, is around 3 gigahertz. Uh, and we have to keep this in mind because we now do another zoom in and look at the hyperfine structure, which is actually due to uh, coupling of the total angular momentum of the molecule to the angular momenta of the, of the nuclei. And then we see that these energy levels further split so that we would expect, instead of this one single line with three gigahertz, actually we would expect six lines. However, um, we cannot see these six lines because they are way smaller than this three gigahertz. So actually the width we would expect is around 10 megahertz. And this is also where these narrowband lasers come into play. Um, because with like a very broad laser, you will not resolve this. So, but what we have to do uh, now is we have to somehow boost our technology by at least a factor of 300 to be able to resolve those lines. And I will now explain how we can do this. So uh, first of all, um, I have to explain the Doppler effect again. So, so usually most of the audience here will know it. Um, so I try to do it with the analogy to sound because the Doppler effect is usually well known for happening with sound waves. Uh, so if you consider, for example, a police car or an ambulance going very fast, the pitch of the sound changes in dependence if the car comes towards you or goes away from you. Uh, and this is because the car usually squeezes the sound waves in front uh, of, its, of its hood, uh, and basically um, behind the trunk, the sound waves are stretched. And therefore, the pitch, um, the pitch changes of the sound you hear. And uh, this effect is called the Doppler effect, and it, may also, it can also occur with light. So if our molecules in a thermal cell move around, they have uh, a wide distribution of different velocities. And um, these different velocities 
see the light or see a different frequency shift for the light waves. So there are several different uh, resonance uh, frequencies, basically, depending on which uh, velocity is in there. And for example, for nitric oxide, the, the average velocity of all those molecules is around 450 meters per second, so quite large. Um, so, and this leads then to a broadening of our spectral line. And now we have to use a spectroscopic technique which gets rid of this broadening. And um, for this, we use this technique of uh, Doppler-free saturation spectroscopy, which is an all-optical technique. So, we re it requires us to do an optical spectroscopy. Um, so, we are go away now from the current signals and um, go to a very simple kind of, of spectroscopy cell looking like this. So, it's just like a very long glass tube where you have your NO through flow in there, and then you use counter-propagating lasers, so called a, a probe and a pump beam, um, going through the cell. And um, in the end, for these uh, very fine structure, you will only get a signal if you, have, uh, if you are in resonance with both beams. And this will only happen um, if the molecule has no velocity relative to the right directions of the beam. So it's, it's fine if it has a a velocity class or a velocity perpendicular to it, but it is not allowed to move along the beams uh, of our lasers. And with this, basically, we pick out a velocity class, so the, v, the, the velocity zero class, and therefore we can uh, basically turn off the Doppler effect uh, and, and uh, retrieve these nice signals, which are called lamp dips. So as you see here, um, we retrieved three of these signals, which are around 10 megahertz wide, um, however, if you listen carefully to, to the previous slides, we would actually expect six of them. So we only were able to partially resolve the hyperfine structure because there's a, a large difference in the strength of these uh, different um, hyperfine transitions. However, what we can observe here now, if we go a bit into detail and look at these lines, is that there's a behavior that for the lowering these J values, so the total angular momentum, uh, without the um, nuclear uh, angular momentum, you, you see that these lines get uh, closer and closer to each other, and at a certain point, two of these lines even merge. This is because we cannot resolve them anymore individually. So what we can do now to analyze this a bit more, we fit it with a folk profile, as you see with the orange line, and then we plot it like this. Uh, so the splitting versus the total angular momentum. And now we can uh, dig into molecular theory and uh, start describing the system with a, a large Hamiltonian based on uh, empirical constants, which give you these splittings. And um, these constants are actually well known for the ground state of this molecule, so we do not need to do anything there. We can just take them from literature and put them into our analysis. But for the excited states, there's actually um, there's some constants, but we can keep the hyperfine constants um, variable and then do a fit to, to fit basically the theory to our experiment. And um, this shows actually quite a nice um, uh, agreement between the data and the theory. And um, of course, um, what we have to do here and what I have to mention is that we had to keep out the lowest three data points on this, um, on this slide because those three data points, we were not able to resolve all those lines, in, lines individually because two lines already merged. So the line position we would extract here is a bit um, it, it's not very accurate, so we left them out for the fit. And yeah, to mention also how to fit this, uh, we use a program called PGOFA, which is actually for molecular simulations, uh, which are also used in the beginning to plot these, um, these, uh, these spectra. And um, yeah, before I show you that we can even further uh, improve the resolution with this technique, I want to quickly compare the fitted hyperfine constants you see in this um, table um, to a paper where this was measured uh, previously um, in, in 2012 using a different spectroscopy technique which is not uh, directly resolving the lamp dips. And you see that there's actually quite a nice agreement. Um, so we see that this new technique, um, doing this with Doppler free saturation uh, spectroscopy is actually compatible to the, uh, this uh, older technique that was used so far, and we can now even decrease the pressure and get a higher resolution um, in our cell, which looks like this. So we have here additional lines appearing. However, now here we have to do a, a more detailed analysis, so I don't want to go uh, into detail on this data. It's a bit preliminary, um, but what uh, 
we really can do now with this technique, and so this is the way back basically to Fabian's talk, because actually this project is on the Rydberg gas sensor, so here now comes the link to the Rydberg gas sensor is, um, he told about this uh, absolute measurements that we need to do this in, in saturation, and uh, to do so, we have to know the saturation intensity, and this can be measured with such a technique by doing measurement series at different powers and pressures. And so this is actually quite important for the optimization of our sensor and also for the analysis of our broadening me mechanisms. So to sum the, the whole talk up, I showed you first uh, continuous phase spectroscopy uh, on nitric oxide, um, which is uh, only possible due to these narrowband continuous wave lasers. Um, with, which has a nice agreement with theory, and um, even a further resolution increase is possible so that we can finally optimize the UV laser, um, uh, laser scheme or the, the gas sensor laser scheme. Basically, you can think of this thing like a microscope. So the more you zoom in with your microscope, the more details you know about the structure and you better, the, the better you understand the structure you have on your microscope. And in our case, the structure is just a molecule and the microscope is a laser. And yeah, with this, um, I also would like to show the team and uh, thank uh, our whole team for working on this project because this is like not an individual effort, but a real team effort. And I also would like to thank you for attending this symposium and uh, this last talk. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Um, for the time being, no question on the chat. The temperature makes so that people are perhaps slowly getting tired, but the, the talk was very interesting. Um, for the moment, no question. Um, waiting for the question, perhaps I would like to close the, the symposium. So it was really the occasion for all the consortium of Maximal to show you part of the work which has been done in the last four years. As you might know, so the, the, pro, the project closes or ends end of, the, of July, and uh, we'll see what, what happens next. Um, as an information, most of you will get uh, a feedback form, so we invite you to send us your feedback, positive or negative. We had some technical issue, but at the end, I think it it went very well. Uh, we succeeded in uh, solving this part of is these issues thanks to the collaborators of the University of Neuchâtel, which are hosting this symposium. Uh, with that, uh, we are at the end. I wish you a very good end of the day, and uh, hopefully uh, we continue to work all together on this atomic vapors.